Hello, my name is Alice White and I'm the Registrar of Wards of Court. I'm here to take you through a presentation on the planning arrangements for the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act and bringing a discharge from wardship application. The Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act commenced on the 26th of April 2023 and it replaces substituted decision making in Ireland with a tiered structure of decision supports for a person who may lack capacity. One of the most important tenets of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act is that there is a presumption of capacity for every individual until shown otherwise. So when a relevant person or a ward of court is assessed, and that's by one of the court's medical visitors, they will look at what tier of support the person may require when they are discharged from wardship. However, it could be a case that the person is found to have full capacity, having recovered from whatever reason, was in the background that brought them into wardship. In that case, they will be discharged and remitted to the management of their own affairs. Any property or assets that are under the control of a committee at this time would be returned to them. Where a person is assessed as requiring the assistance of a decision-making assistant, they will be discharged and they, their funds in court and any property or assets under the management of a committee will be returned to them. A decision making assistant is the lowest tier of support. It is also an informal tier of support. And most importantly, it is the relevant person or the ward of court who select the person they want to assist them making some decisions. The next tier of support is that of a co-decision maker. So that's where a person has been assessed as not having capacity unless they have the assistance of a co-decision maker. Now, a co-decision maker is a person who is selected by the relevant person to make decisions jointly with them. The co-decision maker will enter into an agreement with the relevant person and that agreement is registered with the decision support service. A co-decision making, a co-decision maker is a unique form of decision support and as far as I'm aware, Ireland is the first country to introduce this concept of decision support. Now, the highest tier of support is that of a decision making representative, and that is where the relevant person or the ward of court has been assessed as lacking capacity, even if they have the assistance of a co-decision maker. So they would be unable to even make decisions with the joint assistance of somebody else. A decision making representative is the only tier of support that is appointed by the court. The relevant person doesn't select who they want. However, if they have expressed their will and preference, the court will give great cognizance to the person's expressed will and preference around who they want to act as their decision making representative. The decision making representative is also the closest role to a committee at this time. So I've mentioned the 26th of April 2023. That was when the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act commenced. The wards of court office at that time stopped accepting new wardship applications and we started accepting discharge applications. The discharge application itself can be made by the relevant person or the ward of court. It can be made by the committee and it will be submitted to the office through their solicitor. 
Now, there are other people who can bring a discharge application, but they can only do that where they apply to court through the wards of court office for a court order consenting to them bringing the discharge application. And that can be a relative or a friend of the ward or the relevant person, somebody who's in a position of trust with the person. It may be somebody with a pre-existing relationship, interest or expertise, and that could be somebody who works alongside the ward of court. This could be where an advocate is engaging with the person already and supports the person to bring the application. The final category may also cover a service provider. So perhaps maybe somebody who works with the service provider, although that person would not be able, would be precluded from being appointed as a decision supporter, but they can still bring the discharge application. It may be a social worker or an advocate who's involved with the relevant person. However, as I've mentioned, it is only where they apply to court and the court agrees that that person can bring the application. And I will add that the ward of court and the committee will be put on notice if that application is lodged with the office so they can present their views on it to the court. So some practical information when you're considering the discharge from wardship application. Consult your solicitor. You may want to use the solicitor who worked um, for you bringing the wardship application as they would have some familiarity with the person and also with their affairs. One thing I'd advise on is to check what the solicitor may charge for bringing the application. Every ward of court or relevant person is entitled to bring legal aid, but they may be assessed as having to contribute to the cost of that if they don't meet the financial thresholds. Also, you need to consider if the ward of court has a bank account where a person is discharged with a decision making assistant or a co-decision maker. They should have a bank account open because their funds lodged in court currently will be returned to them and they will need a bank account for that. They will also, if they receive any income, start to receive their own income. So that might be a disability benefit. It may be a pension. It could be rental income of some sort. So they will require a bank account in those circumstances. It's also now time to have a discussion with the ward of court around who they want to help them make decisions. So who would they like to act? It's also an, maybe a timely, um, a natural time to consider whether you have been acting as committee for a number of years. And do you want to step back and have another family member become involved? This might be where somebody has acted as a committee possibly for 20 years and they feel that they've now reached a stage where another family member would be able to better assist or to assist alongside. And if that is the case, you can make contact with your case officer in the office and ask that that person now be joined as a joint committee with you. So they are already in place prior to the discharge application been brought. Another thing to consider, did the person receive or the ward of court receive a large court settlement, such as from a personal injury or a medical negligence action? In those circumstances, you may be required to consult with a financial advisor about having an outline of a plan for how the funds currently lodged in court will be invested to ensure that there are monies available for the future care for the ward of court. Also, at the other end of the spectrum there, 
if there are no funds in court or very little funds in court, then an application can be made to the Legal Aid Board to bring the discharge application. And that would, in those circumstances, the person would not make any contribution. It would be entirely covered by the Legal Aid Board. So the application for discharge itself, it involves a number of legal documents, and this is why it is advisable to have a solicitor represent you. The first document to be lodged is a notice of motion. When that is lodged in the office on its own, the, it will trigger the office contacting the court's medical visitor to carry out the functional assessment. Now, there are different affidavits that will be required to be lodged, but they come at a later date. The grounding affidavit that's setting out all of the information that's required around the discharge application, but also the will and preference of the ward of court and any additional information required for the court to consider. An affidavit of service confirms that the solicitor has served the application on the ward of court and has explained the application to them and recorded their response. The functional capacity assessment will be arranged by the wards of court office. When we receive the notice of motion, we will ask one of our court's medical visitors to make contact with the committee or with the ward or with the service provider to arrange to carry out the assessment. And that will be done at a time and a place that is suitable to the committee and to the ward. It is also open to the committee and to the ward, of course, to obtain their own functional capacity assessment and submit that as part of the application for consideration by the court. And that might be done in the circumstances where it's possible that you will disagree with part of the assessment of the court's medical visitor. But it may also be that you want to have your own independent report before the court for consideration. A schedule of assets will be prepared and sent out to your solicitor and the wards of court office again arrange this. Now, this document will set out what the level of funds are in court what property the ward of court might own, if they have a bank account outside of court or a credit union account, what income they're receiving. So do they have pension income? Do they have a disability allowance? Are they receiving rental income from a property or land? But we can only add in the information that we're aware of, that we have access to on our file in this. So if a person owns a holiday home up in Donegal and nobody has taught to inform us about this, it will not be included on that document. So as I've already mentioned, in certain circumstances, the court will look for an outline of a plan on the future management of funds post discharge. Now, this is not required in all cases. And as a ballpark, it will be where somebody has maybe 250 to 300,000 in excess of that amount lodged in court. But again, it will be individual to particular circumstances. If you're the adult child of an elderly person who is resident in a nursing home, the funds that are lodged in court are required to pay the nursing home fees. So an outline of how those funds will be managed will be very different from that of a young person who might have been in a car accident and has received a large personal injury award. And those funds are required to provide for their future care for the remainder of their life. So as I've said, make contact with the case officer in the office if you need information around this requirement. Now, booklets of pleadings, these are something that your solicitor is going to prepare and each document that is required as part of the discharge application will be combined into a booklet that's lodged in the office and the judge reads through this ahead of the court hearing. Now, it is open to anybody to attend court. So 
at the moment for discharge applications, we've had wards of court attend in person in the four courts, and we've also had a lot of wards of court attend online. So the wards, the wardship list is operated as a hybrid list where people attend the court in person, but they also attend the court remotely using, say, an iPad or a laptop to log in. Just because you attend, it doesn't mean that you have to participate in the proceedings and there is no requirement on you to do so if you do attend. Although it is encouraged and it is a requirement under the Act that the solicitor dealing with the application should encourage the ward of court or the relevant person to participate as much as possible in the discharge hearing. Now, the court's medical visitor will carry out the capacity review. They will make contact with the committee or the service provider or the ward of court prior to carrying out that review, and it will be done at a place and at a time that suits everyone. I've already mentioned you can obtain your own functional capacity report and submit that to the office. The functional capacity assessment itself, it's looking at the person's capacity to make decisions under a number of different headings. And after carrying out that assessment, the medical visitor will rate, make a recommendation around the tier of support the relevant person or the ward needs to make decisions under each of those headings. So the headings are healthcare, welfare, to include activities of daily living, and property and finance. And it can be that the medical visitor will make a recommendation for one tier of support under one heading, but a different tier of support under another heading. Now, it, the medical visitor will look at the person's ability or capacity to understand the information provided to them in order to make the decision. The medical visitor will look at the person's ability or capacity to retain that information long enough to make the decision and to use or weigh up the information made available to them as part of the decision making process. So that might be their capacity to understand the consequences that will arise from the decision or their ability to weigh up the pros and cons to making the decision. And lastly, the person's ability or capacity to communicate that decision. And communication, it isn't just by speaking, but yes, talking, but also to include writing, the use of sign language or assistive technology, or even to communicate by means of a third party. And that will be especially relevant if the person is nonverbal, they may use sign language or the person may not have English as their first language, so they may require a language interpreter. And it would be very important to ensure that if an interpreter is being used to communicate with the relevant person or the ward of court, that an independent person is used. So where a person has been recommended for discharge, with or without a decision-making assistant. Now, with the decision-making assistant, they need a very informal level of support with decision-making, and it might be just in one or two areas. It's not necessarily going to be across all the three areas. If they are being discharged without the requirement of a decision-making assistant, that means they've been fully remitted back to their own affairs, they will be discharged quite quickly after receipt of the medical visitor's report and their property and assets will be returned to them. Now, if a decision making assistant is required, as I've already explained, this is the lowest tier of support and it will see the relevant person supported making some of their own decisions, but they will be making the remainder of their decisions themselves. The agreement does not have to be registered with the decision support service. And the only time you would need to go back into court, and by that I mean 
the circuit court because that's the court that you go to once the person has been discharged from wardship. So the only reason you would need to go back into court is where there has been a change to the person's capacity. And as I've mentioned, in these circumstances, the person receives their own funds and property and they will manage them themselves, possibly with the support of a decision making assistant. And that's why it's important that they would have a bank account open. Now, where a person has been discharged with a co-decision maker, that's that unique form of decision support where the co-decision maker will make decisions jointly with the relevant person or the ward of court. We are advising people to continue using their solicitor they have engaged for the discharge process to help them prepare the co-decision making agreement. This is a document that has to be registered with the decision support service. And in addition to drafting or drawing up the co-decision making agreement, there are additional documents required to enable you to register that agreement with the decision support service. It's on production of proof of registration of this agreement that a person's property and assets will be returned to them. The Decision Support Service website has samples of what a co-decision making agreement would look like. And that um, website is on the, the address is on the final slide in this presentation. If for some reason a co-decision maker is not available and a co-decision maker is somebody, as I've explained, that the ward of court or the relevant person select themselves. So it's somebody that they know, that they trust to help them make decisions jointly. So if they don't have anybody suitable or willing to act, the wards of court office will make contact with the decision support service and seek the nomination of two decision making representatives from a panel that the decision support service operates. Now, these would be independent decision making representatives. The court would then select one of those DMRs and appoint them to act. But in these particular circumstances where the person has capacity with the assistance of a co-decision maker, the court will require the decision making representative to make decisions jointly with the relevant person wherever possible. That way they're still ensuring that the relevant person will have the greatest degree of autonomy possible when they are making their decisions. So if a person is recommended to be discharged with a decision making representative, the decision making representative will be appointed if the relevant person does not have capacity with a co-decision maker. And this would be a recommendation coming from the court's medical visitor. If a person is not available or willing to act as a decision making representative, the wards of court office will seek the nomination from the decision support service of two panel members and the court will choose one of those to act as a DMR. If the proposed, if it had been recommended that a person be discharged with assistance of a co-decision maker and the relevant person and the co-decision maker do not register an agreement within the required time frame, so that's when all of the paperwork has been done up and the agreement has been signed, once it has been signed, there's a five week period in which to present the agreement to the decision support service and register it. Now it's open to come back into the wardship list and say, I need more time to do this. 
and in those circumstances, the court will grant what is known as an extension of time. So if you need more time to register the agreement, you can come back to court and look for that time. But if after that extended time period, the agreement still has not been registered, the application may come back into court and the court may look to appoint a panel decision making representative. And again, the decision support service would nominate two panel members and the court would choose one to act. The decision making representative order, when the person is discharged, the order will be drafted. Now, the order will set out what the decision making representative can do, what their obligations are, what income they can receive. It will set out an obligation on the decision making representative to report to the decision support service, and that will be to report to the decision support service about the decisions they are taking on behalf of the person, but also about the management of their property and assets. The decision making representative will require a bank account to manage the relevant person's funds, because while the Act provides that the funds in court and the property and assets will be returned to the ward of court or to the relevant person, in reality, that person may be completely lacking in capacity and would not it would not be possible for them to open a bank account. So the decision making representative will be required to have a bank account. Now, for any current committees, you probably already have a committee account. So if you expect that a decision making representative will be appointed for your ward, you can make contact with the bank and find out what their requirements are around changing the committee account as it is to a decision making representative account. If you are the person who is going to be appointed as a decision making representative. Now, it may take a bit of time for the bank to work on this, so make contact early, we would advise. This legislation is new for us, but it is also new for the banks. And as I've mentioned, the decision making representative order acts as the agreement within which the decision making representative will operate. So what happens next? Where a ward of court is discharged with a co-decision maker, the agreement will be reviewed at some point in the future in the circuit court. And where they are discharged and a decision making representative is appointed, this again will be reviewed in the circuit court at some point in time. The reviews are going to be held every 12 to 36 months, depending on the individual circumstances of the, of the person. That time frame for a review will be recorded in the discharge order. The wards of court office will notify the circuit court that the person is to be reviewed and it could be in 12 months time. If there is a, some expectation that the person's capacity or circumstances might change and it might be as far out as 36 months or three years, if there is no expectation that the person's circumstances or capacity would change. Now, the, there's a circuit court in every county in the country and every circuit court is dealing with applications under the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. So you would apply in your local circuit court for the review. And where there is an agreement been drafted, especially for the co-decision making agreement, it's advisable to ensure that these are comprehensive, that you sit down with your solicitor and you think about everything 
that needs to be included in the agreement. And this will ensure that you don't have to go back into the circuit court again in 12 months time to have the agreement amended when in fact you could have waited for three years before you have to go back. And again, this is where it is advisable to use a, your solicitor to assist with the drafting of that document. So I'll briefly just take you through. While it's now 2024 and the Act commenced in 20, April 2023, we started our communications campaign with wards of court, with solicitors, and with committees in September 2021. And this was with a view to raising awareness around the Act, to raising awareness among wards and committees about the changes that were going to come as a result of the Act. We've sent out communications giving an introduction to assisted decision making and what it would mean to wards and to committees. We've done communications around the de-risking of funds that are invested by the court service. We've provided information on the different tiers of decision support and the role of the different decision supporters. We've provided information about preparing for court the, the court discharge application and what will that will involve. And these communications, they've been electronic through mass emails, postal communications, we've been involved in different webinars, and we've been holding our online Q&A sessions, which I know an awful lot of you have attended. Now, here are just some websites that will provide information to you on the discharge process, on assisted decision making itself and also um, the central bank website. So if you are consulting with an investment company or a financial advisor, please do check the central bank website to ensure that that company or person is somebody who is authorised to act in Ireland by the central bank. So the wards of court office have their own page on the court service website with information about discharges and about assisted decision making. The email for the office, if you want to make contact with specific quest queries about your own individual circumstances, is wards at courts.ie. The decision support service has guidelines and sample documents that you might feel useful information about the role of, say, a co-decision maker or a decision making representative, what their reporting requirements are, samples of potential agreements that can be drafted. And assisteddecisionmaking.ie is a website run by the health service executive, and that has a number of different webinars about what assisted decision making will mean for interaction with healthcare or social care professionals. And also a lot of information about the will and preference and how a relevant person will interact in expressing their will and preference to healthcare and social care practitioners. Thank you.